Hello, everyone, and welcome to this latest webinar from IHS Technology titled, How to Succeed with SD-WAN. Today, our panel will share their experiences of companies successfully deploying SD-WAN, discuss best practices, and provide guidelines for purchase decision makers. Our webinar is co-presented by IHS and our partners, Cloudgenics, Silver Peak Systems, and Tulare Networks. My name is Alan Tatara, Event Manager for the IHS Technology Webinar Team, and I want to thank everyone for joining us. Now, before we get started, I want to highlight a few features that are available for you, and also just to notify you on how you can participate on our webinar today. Now, the console that you're looking at can be customized as you wish. For example, you can enlarge the view of your slide area by either clicking on the Maximize icon on the top right corner or by dragging down the bottom, the bottom right corner. And you can open, close, move, or resize any of the windows that you have open on your screen and customize as you wish. Now, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a number of application widgets which contain additional features that are available for you. So please make sure you check these out during the webinar. But one button I'd like to mention is the resource list widget. Now, this is the green button that has a document icon on it. And this is where you'll find additional material about today's topic, including the downloadable slide deck from today's session. And all these materials can be accessed and downloaded right from your console. So please take advantage of these uh, during the webinar. And we want to make this an interactive session today, so we've included a Twitter widget at the bottom of your screen, so you'll be able to tweet directly from the console. And today, we're using the hashtag SDWAN. And we'll also have a live Q&A session directly after the presentation, so please submit your questions or comments at any time by using that Q&A box that's on the left side of your screen. And we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. And of course, any questions we cannot get to on the call, our panel will follow up with you directly after the webinar. So now let me introduce to you our panel. So first, leading our discussion is Dr. Cliff Grossner. Cliff is Research Director of the Data Center Cloud and SDN segment at IHS. And also joining us is Vijay Sager. Vijay is Vice President of Product Management at Cloudgenics. And we're also joined by Rolf Meralt. Rolf is Vice President of Product Management at Silver Peak Systems. And rounding out our panel, we have Neil Abogado, Director of Product Marketing at Tulare Networks. So welcome to all of our distinguished speakers today. And now I will turn the controls over to Cliff, and we can get underway. So Cliff? Well, thank you, Alan, and thanks, everyone, for taking time out from a busy day to uh, hear about SD-WAN and some of the very important um, deployments being done by uh, and work being done by my colleagues on the line with me. And today, I really want to look at, from a market perspective, a hard look, I take a hard look at the question, is SD-WAN ready to scale? And hopefully by the end of this presentation, we'll all come to uh, some pretty good conclusions about where SD, uh, SD-WAN technology is and where the marketplace is going. And then after that, we'll take a quick run through at you know what is the problem that SD-WAN is intended to solve and some of the new options that SD-WAN brings to the table. And then you know, what I think we all really want to hear about is those real customer deployments and lessons learned. And each of our sponsors are going to take us through and highlight to us some of the latest deployments that they've done with their customers. We'll come back at the end of the webinar and wrap it up with a couple of short uh, takeaways, takeaways. And then we'll open up the floor to the audience for questions and answers. So let's take a look at uh, the two vectors that are really pushing the SD-WAN market forward. And one of those is the off-premise cloud services market. And what I'm showing you here is our roadmap for that marketplace. And we have two elements superimposed on each other. One is the uh, evolution that uh, we've been seeing in off-premise cloud services. And the other is, how is the WAN been forced to change and expected to change as we move forward? So if we go back in time, you know, we started with off-premise cloud computing, where it was all about moving uh, our servers perhaps into someone else's data center, but nothing much changed. And for that type of connectivity, we used the, what I refer to as MPLS WAN to provide um, reliable, reliable experiences for all the users. Then we moved on to the on-demand computing, where things became more fluid. We could actually rent server time uh, 
uh, as we needed it. And there we also developed the concept of a more flexible WAN, that one that was inter in internet assisted or we had a component that was broadband and MPLS. Now that didn't really serve a lot of the demand and as we even moved forward with the cloud agenda and moved on to agile computing where we adopt hybrid cloud architectures and we want to move workloads from on-premise to off-premise data centers very rapidly, we've now seen that being paralleled by the concept of a software-defined WAN where we use multiple uh, WAN, WAN link types and we have an automated software platform that's based on policy that can actually provide some automated handling of application traffic flows. Where I think we're going to be moving to in the future is as we, as enterprises adopt not just one cloud service provider but many cloud service providers and build their own meta cloud, is that we'll actually see the WAN become an instrument for delivering services on top of uh, transport. And so as uh, we finish solving the transport issue for WAN, we'll move on to providing services. And then that gets us to a full service-oriented WAN for sometime in 2020 and beyond. Now with that, uh, I want to come back to the, the WAN one more time and the effect of off-premise cloud services. And in one of our surveys, we, we asked uh, respondents, what was their expectation for off-premise cloud service drivers? And as we look at that, we realize that this cannot be achieved unless the WAN evolves. And so top things that the enterprise signal they expect with off-premise cloud services is they want better performance with the off-premise cloud services than they had with their in-house applications. They also look to cloud services to make them more agile in terms of the speed at which they can deploy applications. Uh, and on top of that, they expect uh, cost savings all across the board. And so this tells us uh, very clearly that the WAN has become very strategic for enterprises and the perhaps the old style MPLS WAN uh, needs a rethink. Now, I mentioned there were two vectors that are pushing the market forward. The other vector is, is uh, enterprises perhaps preparing to use off-premise cloud, uh, off cloud, off cloud services, but in the interim still need to improve uh, the quality of their WAN, improve performance, perhaps reduce costs. And we asked uh, respondents in a different survey about their plans to invest in data center technologies, which is often a barometer for technologies used to deliver applications uh, all the way to the end user. And for the first time, we asked about plans to invest in software-defined WAN uh, technology, and 45% of respondents indicated they actually intended to increase budget towards the WAN and specifically towards software-defined WAN, looking to, to make enhancements in advance of preparing to move to the cloud. Now, in a recent study, we actually asked uh, very directly about the SD-WAN deployment drivers and what do enterprises that are planning to evaluate or implementing SD-WAN want from SD-WAN. So very clearly, the top of the list is they want SD-WAN to bring automation to the WAN. And that's for two things. One is to simplify the provisioning problem, which uh, many enterprises indicate is uh, is difficult for them because they have to individually program routers and make it make it all kind of work together in a, and, and humans have to figure out how to make that seamless and they also want to be able to bring up new sites or branch offices very rapidly probably even uh, eliminating a truck roll if they can they also want SD-WAN to deliver improved application performance and make all the application delivery more secure and, uh, and we should not ignore the fact that enterprises do expect cost savings and they're looking to improve WAN link utilization to make that happen, and also looking to benefit from virtualizing WAN links. And uh, last but not least is ultimately the deployment of services, L4 to Layer 7 applications, is also something they expect SD-WAN to deliver for them. So one more piece of information that I would like to share with you is we did ask uh, our respondents what was their timeline for evaluating uh, and deploying SD-WAN. And we can see here that there's a very large transition from lab trial to production trial to live production over the next uh, two to three years. So by the end of 2016, 62% of our respondents said they would be in lab trials. And in 2017, we see 76% of respondents expected production trials and 
expected to be in live production by the end of next year. So we, we definitely see that there is a interesting ramp here. Now I will put a caveat in, is that many times the the survey results here are a little more optimistic in the sense that the respondents believe they can go a little more a little faster than they really can with these technologies. So with that, I'm going to push uh, over to uh, Vijay from CloudGenix and let him talk a little bit about why the current WAN uh, architectures are obsolete. Thank you, Cliff. So if we look at today's uh, enterprise uh, WAN models, they were really designed for your traditional WAN where you had MPLS connectivity uh, going back to a, cent a set of centralized applications in the data center. Cloud connectivity, um, uh, more of an afterthought uh, where you peeled off some traffic. And the SLAs were really network centric. But if we look at what customers are doing with their business, they're actually asking for their enterprise WAN to become much more dynamic and also supporting of heterogeneous technologies so that they can actually move to hybrid um, WAN infrastructures where they could take MPLS, broadband internet, LTE, and mesh it into a single unified fabric, as well as having a flexible hosting model where they can host applications in a public cloud, go to SaaS, as the business needs with direct cloud, cloud connectivity, as well as really striving to align the WAN infrastructure to business metrics rather than connectivity metrics, things like app, app transaction time, voice quality, MOS score, and really looking to application reachability connectivity SLAs rather than just can I deliver a ping packet. On that, I'd like to hand over to Rolf from Silverpeak. Thanks, Vijay. Good morning, everyone. So, you know, basically, CJ was saying the uh, Vijay was saying the legacy one made sense when application lived in the enterprise data center. And so it's predictable, it was reliable, it was private. But the bad part about it is the rigidity and the expense. And so applications today are moving to SaaS, they're moving to the cloud. Um, we see inconsistent users often see a better SaaS experience when they access the enterprise app, Office 365 from home, than when they do from, from the enterprise. And so we see, a, a a bad SLA from the user's point of view, and then we also see very high costs for the enterprise. So bandwidth being very limited with MPLS, lead times being very high, it takes a long time to provision a new circuit. And a lot of customers have been adding internet as passive backups, but they're not using that capacity actively. So essentially they're wasting a lot of bandwidth they're paying for just because they don't have the ability to implement active active multipathing in a way that uh, that meets enterprise SLAs. And finally, the, the MPLS networks are complex, right? So traditionally, the WAN is built around routers. Admins set up VRFs. They set up per application or try and set up per application routing using protocols like PFRs. Uh, we see a lot of firewall creep once you add the internet to the branches because now you have a public uh, network access to the branch and so you, you, you see a lot of um, uh, additional needs for equipment that needs to be managed and so on and so on. Recreational traffic can often impact the business without having uh, the extra visibility. Um, I'll pass it on to uh, Neil from Tellari at this point. Thanks, Rolf, and I'd like to add my welcome to everyone. And what I'll go through now is I'll chat a little bit about some of the critical IT challenges that the current you know, WAN model are instilling basically within you know, the, the accounts that we are encountering. And so a couple of things come to mind. You know, a common refrain is you know, I, the need for uh, a vastly more or increased amount of bandwidth. So the amount of traffic being generated within the, 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 the networks uh, that are, are out there in the enterprises in particular is growing uh, quite a bit, and that is impacting all aspects of the data center and WAN. And so continued uh, growth and being able to accommodate that growth within the other constraints that are being mandated within an organization are key. And so that's the first one. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about performance expectations. And this is going beyond just having bandwidth being made available. Basically, ensuring that you're able to offer the SLAs 
to get the traffic wherever it needs to go. And not only uh, the SLAs that are tied to things such as latency, jitter, uh, as example, or loss that can impact the, the traffic. We also are having things such as a transition from a model of just having, let's say, failover to having business continuity being a key factor as a part of the, the new WAN that people are looking at building out because they're having challenges with things failing over without an outage with the traditional WAN model. And then on top of that, you need to have the reporting and analytics in order to go through and validate that the network and infrastructure is performing according to what you expect and what your SLAs are going to require you to have a good user experience. Beyond that, speed to market, agility. We're finding that, quite, quite frankly, you know, the old model of going through and deploying a traditional WAN where maybe your MPLS circuit comes in in 90, 120 days to get installed, that's going to be the long pole in your deployment. Many of the other technologies that are going out to support, let's say, an application rollout, especially during the era of virtualization and cloud, can be provisioned and deployed in an order of magnitude less time. So you want your WAN, SD-WAN in particular, to be able to give you the agility and time to market to be competitive. Last point. More for less. We're going to bring in the budget constraints that, you know, once again, we see this as very typical, which is you know, IT budgets, budgets for the WAN are typically flat, slightly down, slightly up, but usually they're not going to be in a neighborhood to accommodate all the other demands with the other growth, uh, especially in throughput that is required. So what it's basically in making is organizations look to new ways in order to address their economic restrictions and the needs of the rest of the business. So now I'm going to hand it back to VJ to talk about some of the new options. VJ, over to you. Uh, VJ, you on mute? I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, thank you for uh, that reminder, Cliff. Really, there's an opportunity to move from transport-defined and packet-defined fabrics to really application-defined WAN fabrics that span not just your traditional enterprise WAN, but also can extend to uh, cloud services, be it um, SaaS services like Office 365, NSFDC, or things like Amazon Web Services. And what we can do here is by moving to these applica application-defined WAN fabrics, we could change the unit of operation of the fabric from being a packet, which is a stateless entity, where your metrics are necessarily going to be packet loss, jitter, and latency, to one where the unit of operation is an application flow or a session, where you're actually looking at the application transactions themselves, so you're actually able to measure directly things like MOS score for a WebRTC session if you're deploying a Office 365 link or WebEx, or if you are looking at cloud connectivity to AWS, you can actually measure not just what the latency is to Amazon Web Services, but what is the application response time for your given enterprise application, and what percentage of that is driven by the network component or the data center component. Those attributes are very, very powerful in allowing you not just to define your fabric, but ensure your applications are delivered with fidelity to meet SLAs. So with the CloudGenix architecture, there's an opportunity now to, as I'm waiting for the slide to build, yes, to provide you not just uh, hybrid WAN connectivity where you can uh, dramatically reduce costs and go active-active to a traditional data center, but you could also replicate that exact same model in the cloud with Amazon Web Services and extend it in a gatewayless fashion to SaaS-based applications and services like Office 365, WebEx, Salesforce.com, and Citrix. So in a nutshell, you can really enable a truly transport agnostic model that's cloud-ready and is gateway-free. So on that note, I would like to hand back over to Rolf. Thanks, Vijay. So, you know, just to, to continue, in, in, much, in much the same way as compute virtualization and the server hypervisor gave servers an abstraction, SD-WAN really abstracts the physical transport WAN network. And so the physical WAN becomes an underlay that connects SD-WAN edge forwarding elements, what we call edge connect, but edge forwarding elements. And those can handle active-active multipathing, QoS, security, and exception routing. 
SD1 endpoints terminate Ethernet. They also speak standard open layer 3 protocols, so they can interact with your uh, current routed network, so they can deploy into a brownfield. And one of the big components of SD1, obviously, is this concept of, of central management, right, sort of the vSphere for the network. And so businesses now can define the intent of how they want an application to connect users to the network and a central orchestration element will distribute that policy to all of the SD-1 elements. And so that contributes greatly to diminishing attack surfaces. It contributes greatly to diminishing OPEX expenses and making sure that you don't have these sort of unique snowflake branches that are just slightly different from the others in your network. Some of the um, you know some of the value props of, of SD1. Obviously, we've talked about the uh, the wine costs can be up to 90% of of the enterprise's uh, IT budget, and so obviously uh, bringing in a cheaper form, a more cost-effective form of connectivity, in an active-active multipathing way with more sophisticated path heuristics is is a key value. Zero touch provisioning we've talked about as well is also extremely important. The ability to abstract the personality of the endpoint as a software service profile as opposed to a set of hundreds of ACLs on, on a router. Increasing availability and bandwidth is also a very key requirement for businesses because not all applications have the same, have the same requirements of, of the network. And so you can have this concept of essentially a synthetic SLA where admins can define what the voice application wants the network to look like in terms of latency, loss, and jitter, whereas the replication application may have very uh, different requirements and can possibly uh, focus more on diminishing the, uh, the cost per bit. So you can have uh, very different policies depending on the slices of the SD-1 network. Finally, visibility and security. We want to uh, manage applications at the application flow level and not simply packet by packet. And so we need to have a concept of end-to-end -end application flows. And the traffic of these overlays needs to be encrypted, and we don't want to have the complexities of key management. So encryption and no key management and service chaining more and more is becoming also a big requirement from customers. They want to avoid having firewalls in each of the branches, either consolidate them or work together with some of the uh, firewall as a service uh, type of offerings in the cloud. With that, back over to you, Neil. Okay, so what I'll go through right now is we'll chat a little bit about the architecture that we uh, are leveraging in order to address you know, uh, and build out an, a software-defined WAN. So the first thing is we're going to start off with by looking at the physical layer. And similar to some of the other points that we've talked about, you know, we're going to have basically multiple types of connectivity that will be brought into play. Most uh, of the customers find are coming in with an established MPLS infrastructure, and into that they're augmenting it with uh, either Internet connectivity, satellite, uh, cellular, uh, a variety of different types of links. So basically, uh, links that can pass IP traffic between locations will be incorporated into the overall uh, underlying physical infrastructure. And then we're going to combine that with the different types of nodes that are required to allow for the, 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 the WAN, quite frankly, wherever the points are located to interface in. So that will be physical, uh, virtual, and cloud-based appliances. On top of that, we're going to have a virtual layer. And in this case, virtual is referring to the WAN. So we're going to have an overlay come into place. And this is going to offer, obviously, the connectivity. It will abstract some of the complexities of the underlying physical infrastructure uh, into the uh, connectivity model that will be used to actually uh, pass traffic between the uh, endpoints, the nodes that reside in the various locations. This will be orchestrated through a controller. So a controller construct to go through support provisioning, also support monitoring, and also support adjusting the infrastructure uh, based upon you know, the statistics and information that we're receiving back on the overall state of the environment. And that goes into the last point there, which is detailed WAN visibility. In order to make accurate and very rapid decisions regarding uh, how traffic should be processed, to all, obviously to maintain SLAs, you're going to need a very uh, detailed view and a, almost a real-time view of what's happening within the environment in order to make those decisions and not have traffic or uh, sessions or applications being impacted or to minimize the impact. 
and that's another key component that you're going to have to have as a part of this virtual layer. And last, all of this is being done, obviously, to support the applications. And so we usually will uh, accommodate two things here. There's the dedicated requirements of a given app. So you'll usually have uh, interactive apps. You're going to have real-time applications. Bulk applications are examples of some of the categories that uh, we can make uh, to, to define how application traffic needs to be handled. But then on top of that, we're going to layer in business policy. So we need to be able to take, understand both of those factors and have those basically installed and instilled basically throughout the SD-WAN so that it will react according to the requirements of both, both that, once again, of policy and of what the application it need, needs in general. On top of that, you're going to require analytics and reporting. You're going to need this to ensure that you, you know, the network is performing as expected, uh, to help troubleshoot when issues do arise, and also to perform capacity planning as you look and, you know, as the demands on the network continue to grow, you'll have the data then to proactively go out and plan and accommodate that overall over time. So now we will have a poll question. So I'm going to hand this back to Cliff to go through the poll. Cliff, over to you. Well, thank you, Neil. And uh, we told you what our research showed about the drivers for SD-WAN, and we'd like to hear from the audience. So. If everyone could just take uh, one second or two and uh, indicate which is your top choice, select one, uh, as to why you would evaluate or implement uh, SD-WAN. And while we're letting people make a choice, I'd like to remind everyone we will have a Q&A session, so uh, now is a good time to start to think about your questions and enter them so that we can uh, have a really interesting and dynamic uh, discussion uh, just after the next section or two. So with that, let's have a look and see how the audience voted. And it looks like, oh, oh okay, we have a pretty close uh, tie here between reducing costs as a top driver and automation. And so, and those go hand in hand, so that makes a lot of sense. And close behind that is uh, improving application performance. So that's uh, a little different than our survey results where reduced costs didn't come quite to the top, but good to see that uh, result. And uh, that will help us understand uh, and the vendors understand what your needs are in terms of SD-WAN. So with that, I'm going to push it forward and let's hear about some real live customer deployments. And uh, Vijay, uh, if you could take us through that or lead us off, I'd really appreciate it. Vijay, you on mute. Sorry, that's twice. Uh, thank you very much. The first example I'd like to speak to is a, an enterprise organization in North America that is actively uh, transitioning from a traditional data center model to a mix of SaaS and uh, AWS hosted applications. So strategically, they want to leverage SaaS where possible to reduce costs and also to align their organization to um, core competencies. And they really want to uh, embark upon a uh, zero to two to five year transition to AWS cloud for uh, ostensibly as many of their enterprise applications as they possibly can. So they've got a mix of applications from uh, UC to Microsoft Office to the standard suite of traditional enterprise and custom apps that, that some could expect. And the traditional enterprise and the custom apps were the um, were where they felt there were the areas of most interest and value and potentially risk in moving to the AWS cloud. So they were wanting to figure out a way to provide cost-effective connectivity to that cloud from their entire branch infrastructure, but also being able to maintain and perhaps even enhance visibility and control for their application performance. So as we've embarked upon this journey together, uh, what they've done is they've deployed a virtual ION 7000 in the AWS cloud. What that allowed them to do is that allowed them to go uh, directly to the, um, uh, to the enterprise uh, applications within their uh, AWS environment, and they've been able to go directly to uh, Office 365 and others without having to go through any sort of a, uh, a gateway. Some of the things that they found as they've been uh, deploying the solution. Uh, the first thing that they found was the AutoConnect VPN from the branch to AWS was very, very dynamic, and it actually took into account application reachability and, um, and brownouts, which are often not 
uh, accounted for in traditional VPNs. Uh, the second benefit that they had actually was really around uh, some of the AWS zones and multiple application instances. With, uh, with the deployment, they were able to identify for their enterprise and for their custom apps if there was a outage or a disruption inside an AWS availability zone for a specific application instance. And the system would automatically detect that and redirect the traffic to the, uh, the up instance without actually having to resort to uh, some sort of an external uh, elastic load balancer. And they were also able to get uh, true SLA monitoring from the perspective of end user performance for these AWS hosted and SaaS applications. One of the things that they were able to see was they were able to see what their MOS scores looked like for WebEx. So as their end users were deployed in the branch, they were able to see what is the voice quality for WebEx for this hosted service? And then finally, um, as everyone has mentioned, and as was number one in the poll survey, they were actually able to significantly reduce the costs of their WAN fabric by leveraging the Internet uh, for connectivity. So the second use case that I'd like to speak to, as it's uh, coming up, I hope, are you guys seeing the slide advance, Cliff? Uh, yes. Okay, I guess it's just me. Um, the, the second use case that I'd like to speak to is really a traditional retailer. Their primary objective is to go to a hybrid WAN to reduce cost and really drive a branch technology migration um, and move away from proprietary legacy router plus VPN plus hardware with a lower cost, simpler to manage x86 solution. Key applications, guest portal, credit card, point of sales, and physical security. Right? That's what their, their business is. And, and as the customer told me, their, uh, their sole reason for, uh, for being on the IT side is to maximize the number of successful high-value credit card swipes they can do in any unit of time. That's really what they're all about. So the challenges that they, uh, that they had to overcome and the assurances that they need to give to their retail business is that as they were moving to this hybrid WAN, they needed to uh, ensure and maintain the uptime of the transaction processing applications. Credit card swipes couldn't error out. Credit card swipes couldn't take longer because if they, uh, um, they end up getting extended or if they have to re-swipe uh, on an unreliable or less reliable Internet connection, what happens? Lines get longer and people might walk out of the store. And, of course, uh, there was no budget available to them or retraining customers, I'm sorry, um, it, administrators and um, employees on new technologies. So the technology needed to be very, very simple and self-explanatory. So now if we look to uh, what they've done in, uh, in their branch environment is they've, they've been able to consolidate uh, a lot of those uh, proprietary devices into a single ION 3000. Uh, they have a mix actually now of virtual ION 3000s and, and physical depending on their specific uh, footprint in their branch. But they were also able to consolidate some of the security functions and other services into the ION 3000 uh, with things like the zone-based firewall. So what are the, some of the benefits that they saw? I mentioned the big thing that they wanted to do is maximize the number of uh, credit card transactions. Well, what they were able to show over the, um, the holidays is they were able to, even in times of uh, unreliable Internet and actually even LTE, they were able to uh, swipe several seconds off of each credit card transaction, uh, and they were able to do it with uh, virtually no uh, session connection errors or retransmissions. The other benefit that they had is they were able to actually take from the time a ION 3000 uh, device showed up at the branch, they were able to plug it in, have it automatically authenticate and authorize against the cloud and be up and running in less than 10 minutes. Very, very simple to manage, no routing required, um, uh, with simple integrated services so that they were able to meet their, their training and operational simplicity requirements as well. So now if we look at 
um, in summary, what are some of the solution benefits customers can expect to see from a, a Cloud Genix SD-WAN solution? First one, obviously hybrid WAN. You can actually uh, get 10x plus price, per, uh, price performance uh, benefits just by simply uh, uh, folding Internet and LTE and other local uh, cost transports into your enterprise WAN fabric. Secondly is the ability to move to the, the Nirvana of the Commodity X86 branch like people have done with uh, compute in the data center. Thirdly, moving to a software-defined enterprise <coughs> where they're able to actually extend their enterprise fabric from the branch to the data center to the, uh, to the cloud and move to an application-based model of provisioning and delivery with things like SOAs, and then finally, with the zone-based firewall capability, the ability to establish a dynamic security perimeter uh, with uh, full protections as well as uh, uh, compliance. On that, I would like to hand back over to Rolf. Thanks, Vijay. So I'll, I'll offer my, uh, my, my first case study is a um, large auto auto repair center, and, and the, the way that they do their business is they are a franchise. So we actually have a lot of customers where their business model operates around franchises, and a lot of these customers have in common the fact that they need to grow very fast, and they have a very diverse brown mix of brownfield and greenfield um, um, legacy ones that they're essentially trying to integrate at that point. Uh, just a little, little bit of background on, on the applications that they run. When um, this customer goes out and onboards a new franchise, they basically send a team of 15 people on a given date to the, 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 the site of the, uh, the franchise owner who's joining the network. And so on that date, everything needs to come together. And so one of the issues that they actually had with MPLS, which was uh, much more costly than, than, than the monthly bill, was we asked them, you know, by how much did you slip one of your fr onboarding of one of your franchises because the network was not available on that day and you sent 15 people that basically sat around their hotel rooms. And so their response was six months, and that was in South Carolina. So M the MPLS lead time is an issue not just in some remote parts of the world. It's also something that is, that is present here. So just um, you know, giving you a, a few of the metrics, they have 264 five sites in the network. Because these franchises are generally owned by individual people that don't have a direct relationship with each other, the network topology that they wanted was a logical hub-and-spoke virtual overlay. And this allows them to offer their finance and accounting backend. It offers uh, it allows them to offer secure network segmentation, and they also have a custom application that they use to upload for each one of these repairs. So there's about 24 photos that basically get uploaded from damage to repair completion. And so being able to navigate those uh, in real time was a key requirement. Even with one optimization with a previous vendor, that was something they could not do where you could click through in real time. So basically, higher bandwidth, higher performance, but most of all, a network that was a lot more unified in terms of being able to be managed by policies. Over the years, if you look at some of the, um, uh, the, the different sites that they had, they had some sites, some service centers that had MPLS. They had some that had broadband internet, and the way that they connected those to the network was through a sort of VPN firewall. There's no way to have a single business policy and apply that across a network that diverse if you're not abstracting the physical network and building a virtual overlay. So the uh, the ease of deployment was one of the, the, the key factors in, in this case study. They um, wanted to be able to deploy both in what we call inline bridge modes, so essentially at a layer two level, inserting the overlay as a bump in the wire, as well as in some of their sites, consolidating all the routers and firewalls into a single device. And so in that case, the SD-WAN forwarding element becomes the next hub gateway for the branch, including offering some services such as DHCP and DNS. So all of these options are essentially key to be able to deploy SD-WAN into brownfield um, environments. 
The uh, moving on to the, the the second the second use case is uh, Kingston, which probably a, a, a lot of a, a lot of the audience would know as a as a flash and, and and memory maker. And so Kingston's main requirement was flexibility in terms of application path policies, but also performance. And so to just give a little bit more background, in um, Kingston has about 4,000 employees worldwide. In 2010. Due to a uh, hum due to human error, they lost their main data center, which was which was in California. So some of the power circuits got got, got tripped, and uh, they decided to stand up an, a number two data center in Taiwan. And so essentially, they were looking for a solution where you could uh, build a network with two data centers and mostly hub and spoke topologies in terms of connecting branches. A lot of the expansion of the company happened and is happening in China, and so they wanted to be able to have policies where you could have certain applications join a virtual network that was hub and spoke so that the traffic had to go to the data center if it was a data application, but if it was a voice application, it could go direct branch to branch. So we see this sort of concept of having an SLA in terms of the topology as well as the path policy, which can be described from a single plane of glass using a business intent policy. Another element that was really key for Kingston was for the Chinese locations, um, they were using broadband internet and they were seeing about 2.11% packet loss, which resulted in, uh, in, a fair, in, in a fairly large degradation in terms of the end-to-end uh, -end TCP uh, throughput. And so one of the key elements of an SD1 technology is the ability to be able to deal with active-active multipathing in terms of reordering the packets as they come from, from different paths and getting the packets back into sequence, as well as being able to adapt to a physical underlay, underlay, the internet in this case, that is not always as high quality as, uh, as, as a private network such as MPLS would be. So to summarize, the, the first thing that, uh, the, that SolarPix SD1 brings to the table is connection diversity, so flexibility to add another transport like broadband, or more and more uh, customers are looking to use 4G LT. As, as another path to complement or replace, in some cases, MPLS. Diversity reduces costs and brings, obviously, a, a lot more flexible uh, exception routing failover capabilities. The second element is that when you manage how you connect users to applications using policies and business intent, one, you simplify the infrastructure, you avoid snowflake uh, branches that could be uh, security liabilities. And number two, you can scale. So the example that I gave in the first case study of the 265 branches, those were onboarded over the course of about four to five weeks, so essentially 40 sites a week, and that assumes that you can drop ship the device. Third, you want to improve the performance of your key applications, and today, 50% of that key application traffic is going to be SaaS or private cloud traffic. And so you need a solution that can combine the resources to maximize availability, security, and performance across both cloud apps and uh, native apps in the data center. Finally, you maximize your RRI by ensuring optimal active-active resource utilization, so internet not just as a backup. You minimize OPEX through dropshipping devices, support of physical and virtual appliance form factors, and you get out of the business of having to deploy an admin to each site to go um, tickle a router CLI and configure ACLs and, and, and routing protocols manually. This obviously frees up IT staff to work on more value-added um, uh, projects. But the other, the other um, element I'll, I'll leave in the end is SD1, as well as technology, also has a business model component. And so as customers are getting used to consuming clouds, cloud apps by the drink, by the hour, SD1 is also technology that we foresee is going to be consumed as a monthly spend, as an optional add-on of layer 4 
to layer seven services on top of the uh, the, the virtual WAN overlay. So it's both a, bit a transition in the business model as well as the underlying te technology enablement. With that, I'll uh, I'll stop here and pass it uh, pass it over to Neil. Thanks, Ralph. And what I'm going to do now is we'll go through, as you can probably tell, the model is we're going to have two case studies. So our first one has uh, to do with Bremer Bank. And this is a financial institution based in the Midwest. And they have approximately uh, a little over 100 sites total that they wanted to integrate into, uh, well, their emerging uh, WAN. So deployed initially on MPLS. Uh, they had each site up and running, but they were encountering some, some challenges. And the challenges had to do around, or revolved around having availability and, and continuity in service. So they were having periodic outages. They were very detrimental to the overall environment as you would expect. And thus, they were looking for an alternative solution. The first attempt at that, and what we highlight in the diagram, is they went with dual MPLS. So they actually went through in about 40%, 40 offices, they went through and deployed MPLS, a secondary provider and network, into the scenario in order to help give them the resiliency that they needed. And also, they were looking to help address some bandwidth concerns and constraints that they were dealing with as well. Well, well while they had the solution up and running in the initial 40 offices, they were having some problems with that solution as well. And they were twofold. The first was the failover. Failover was not, uh, would incur outages, basically. So their calls would get dropped, application sessions needed to be restarted, so they were unable to fail over uh, without having impact to the business. Number two, it wasn't active-active. So a very common refrain, which is, it's my standby network, I'm paying for it, and I'm not getting much value out of it until a disaster takes place. I would like to change that approach. So those were the two motivations that they had going into re-architecting their WAN. So the solution that they wound up going with was they did two things. They tore out the redundant MPLS infrastructure and put in internet connectivity. In fact, DSL in particular is one of the, the, the connectivity types that they're using quite a bit overall with the new infrastructure. And then as you would expect, you're going to have to have the endpoints installed as well, you know, something we talked about in the architecture section of the, of, of the session. And basically they've done that. And so they've done this in all of their locations at this point. And what does it give them? Well, they've been thrilled with the experience for a couple of reasons. So first of all, they're getting the continuity that they're looking for. When, in fact, when they initially rolled this out, it didn't take them long to actually validate um, the continuity because of the fact that they had an outage on the MPLS network two weeks after they installed one of their initial sites. Nobody called. Nobody knew there was a problem. It failed over, no sessions got dropped. So they were very thrilled and it was in line with what they'd expected to come out of their proof of concept phase. And so, you know, they were pleased, but, you know, having it work in production, if you will, was definitely a benefit. So they were able to obviously capture and, and mitigate one of their key concerns. The next thing that they were also thrilled about is now they have the benefits of the economics of Internet bandwidth being leveraged in an active, active type of scenario. So at the end of the day, they were able to save, and, you know, we've quantified the numbers here, you know, according to them, they have uh, – $200,000 in savings on just the WAN cost by swapping out that redundant network from MPLS and using internet and broadband connectivity. It also changed their mindset, and this is what the quote goes into, which is now they have the ability to not necessarily, you know, they're focusing more on price and access when they look at their providers because they feel that they have now with the technology that the SD-WAN delivers, that Tulare delivers, the ability to go through and it can massage and basically handle uh, any of the imperfections within the underlying network very effectively and give them the SLAs that they need while also giving them the economics that they desire in order to you know, address the overall corporate needs. The last thing that they like is you know, how do they make sure that the performance is where it needs to be? How do they ensure that the providers are meeting the SLAs that they've committed to Bremer Bank? They love the analytics. So they go through detailed reports that can highlight any uh, anomalies, and they love to go back and you know, they, they talk to us about this quite a bit and, and talk to their providers and say, hey, you know, you're know, you not meeting your SLAs. In fact, they've made decisions to move from providers based upon the data that we've been able to report back to them on the overall performance that a given provider has. So you can hold your providers accountable based upon the information that the SD-WAN is able to deliver, the Tolari is able to deliver. The next customer I want to talk about is Maricopa 911. So this is the 911 processing or call center infrastructure for the greater Phoenix area. 
And as you'd expect, this is pretty mission critical information that's going on. It is literally life and death in some cases that's going over the network or being handled as part of uh, the applications and the calls that are being uh, serviced. So in this case, they have 25 locations throughout the metro Phoenix area that are basically handling and processing calls and the infrastructure that's required on the back end to support those calls. Now, their challenges were, uh, well, a couple fold. So as you can tell with the diagram, they basically came in with dedicated infrastructures for voice, for data, and they also had a backup internet uh, connection or infrastructure that was built out. And similar to our other cases, the internet was strictly used as a backup in case the frame relay link, in this case, were to fail at a location, and they used IPsec VPNs over the internet in order to support backup connectivity. So similar to the other challenges, Active active is not a part of this, so it's active passive as far as the internet connection is concerned. And also the general cost about of building out purpose, you know, built networks to support the various types of traffic was not very cost effective. So but the challenge they had is they'd like to converge and start to centralize their services on top of one common infrastructure, but they were worried about the resiliency and the ability of a packet-based infrastructure to support the traffic that they needed to run on top of it, especially on the voice side. So in those two challenges in mind, they worked with us to go to a new model. And so deploying the hardware in the appropriate locations, and then on top of that, they moved away from a purely dedicated infrastructure for voice. They collapsed that down. And then they also move from a dedicated frame relay infrastructure. In fact, they're moving away from frame relay. I don't think that's too much of a surprise. But what they needed was to have an infrastructure that can allow them to handle that within this, uh, with, their, uh, with this new infrastructure. And they now do. And so what they're now doing is they're able to go through, use all the bandwidth all the time. You know, in the previous world, uh, for them, they had eight seconds of delay in failing over, for an example. And now it's well, it's in use and it's instantaneous, so they don't have any calls or any issues uh, with outages, once again, as traffic uh, has encounters issues or uh, challenges are encountered over the WAN. So that's number one. Actually, number two also is the fact that when they did their cutover, they went through and they did all the sites within less than three weeks. They also did them hot. What I mean by that, they didn't even turn off the 911 processing in the given call center when the upgrade and the changes to the network were taking place. They actually deployed us uh, real time, and there was no impact. So the ease of deployment, especially with an overlay model, uh, can be um, you know, quite nice, quite good. It makes it you know, nice to cut in, easy, and uh, very effective as far as getting the service up and running very quickly and helps with your agility. And at the end of it all, you know, basically they've got the, the direction set for, you know, they've got their infrastructure in place, they've built it out, and now they're moving forward. Uh, with this as the foundation for their 911 call center. And then the quote from the customer there is, you know, very indicative of, you know, they love the sub-second uh, failover capabilities that really do not <clears throat> incur any outages as they go through and operate their network. So with that, I'm now going to transition over, and I'll talk a little bit about Tulare. So we say that we have a proven SD-WAN solution. Uh, why? Well, we've been in business uh, since 2008. We've been focused on making WAN solutions, in particular the, the technology that we've talked about today. We have over, well, we have hundreds of customers. Over 200 are deploying uh, deployed using our technology today in thousands of nodes around the world. Okay? And so our solution is called the Software Defined Thinking WAN. It basically encompasses many of the points that we've talked about where we have the ability to consolidate and leverage different types of links. So whether you be whether it be MPLS or hybrid infrastructure that incorporates uh, broadband connectivity or satellite or LTE, cellular, uh, it really doesn't matter. We support all of those. We have the form factors to go where you need to when it comes to deployment options, so physical devices from low end, uh, sm small home office type of deployment, all the way up to data center caliber physical appliances, Cloud appliances and virtual appliances are also available. And then lastly, we have the intelligence, and this is very important. We have the analytics, the reporting, that not only help us know what's going on within the network, but also helps, especially with our controller, help it identify where, when changes need to be made, and it can make them very quickly in order to, once again, give you the SLAs that your applications require. The net result of this is that you get the capacity to grow, Within the economics that you're required, so you get the cost savings that uh, you're typically going to find uh, you're being pressured to support. 
And on top of that, you get the SLAs and service continuity that's required to keep your users happy. And so with that, I'm now going to hand it back to Cliff. Well, thank you, Neil. And um, we're uh, getting very near the top of the hour, and I would like to save time for at least one question or two. And so I'm going to just sort of quickly jump through and answer the question if SD-WAN is ready for prime time. And in my mind, it is. We are market is moving towards deployments from trials in the right time frame. Enterprises know what they want from SD-WAN. There's a good choice of new WAN architectures. We have some solid and scaled proof points, as we've just heard. So the marketplace can have um, a, good, a good experience at shopping and comparing solutions. And at the same time, we have documented significant immediate cost reductions. And we've also heard discussions around a positive ROI achieved in a rather short time frame from our sponsors. So with that, let me jump into the uh, question and answer. And my first question is actually for Rolf. Uh, and one of our um, one of our uh, one of our listeners has challenged you on your 90% claim. So they're asking if you can provide some color as to when that may. What are the contexts for having that kind of reduction? Yeah. So th there's there's a number of uh, studies out there, right? From you know, I don't know if Infinitics, but they're part of other other analysts and, and vendors. And so, generally, if you compare um, an equivalent MPLS circuit in terms of the bandwidth uh, to broadband internet, you know, your $2,600 a month will drop to um, about $100, $100 a month or maybe a little bit more, uh, you know, using San Francisco as a data point I have in mind here. Uh, so these, these obviously vary from geography to geography. The, the other element, you know, besides the 90% that I just want to highlight from the first case study that we did with the, uh, the 265 sites at, uh, at the, uh, the, the, serv the service center is um, lead time to provision, and that in some geographies uh, entirely cuts out MPLS from the picture, even not 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 looking at cost. And so, you know, the example of the truck roll of 15 guys to South Carolina, and then they're they're sitting around waiting for months to get the uh, the circuit provision. Okay, and we have another, uh, I think, very important question, and I think I'll ask uh, Neil for to speak to this one. Uh, from uh, someone in the financial industry is very concerned about security implications. Uh, is there a greater need for firewalls with SD-WAN? And does the extra security costs impact cost savings? So usually what we'll find is that the, the connections, the overlay, if you will, the traffic that goes between the nodes is encrypted. So usually you'll have AES 256-bit uh, being used to process the traffic between the sites. And usually that suffices for most locations, even if the traffic's going over the Internet, for them to be you know, satisfied that that will help keep their sessions secure. The other thing that will also take place is if we're load balancing sessions across multiple links, if somebody's going to try and capture the packet, then they're going to have to capture it on two or three different links, which is the odds of that happening are very remote. So you know, from a transport perspective, um, connectivity between the sites does continue to help uh, or is usually thought of being as relatively secure. Now, if the traffic is destined towards the Internet and uh, – uh, you know, an external site where you may not have uh, a device uh, on both ends, let's say we're doing internet load balancing, then you may want to have a firewall in place as a part of that to offer security services if it's being, you know, used directly from the branch instead of backhauling it, as many customers will do, into a centralized data center and having, you know, where the security infrastructure is in place to forward the traffic out. Okay, well, that's great. And I have one more question, and that would be for VJ. And again, one of our listeners is indicating that for them, the quality of service over the internet is uh, a major concern, and they're wondering how SC WAN is able to fix that. Yes, so there's a there's a couple of things that you can do. One, um, you're actually going to be leveraging both the internet and the MPLS network in an active active fashion. So uh, the SD WAN system will be able to either. Uh, at least with CloudGenix, will be able to understand how the application is performing against an SLA. So on that Internet link, if you've got a high-priority application uh, that is underperforming against an SLA and lower-priority applications have significant margin, we can uh, requeue and reprioritize and reallocate bandwidth uh, to that higher-priority application so that you can get really more of an application-centric SLA on an Internet link. The second thing 
is uh, you also have the ability, because you're active-active, to see when the application performance for that critical app falls below a threshold to use the, uh, the backup MPL or the other active MPLS link to carry that uh, traffic. So there's a, a few different ways the system can respond. Okay, well, thank you, Vijay. And I think that concludes uh, the time we have for answering questions. There were a number we didn't get to, which we can follow up by email. I will conclude as I pass it over to Alan for a final remark to let people know that we are actually working on an SD-WAN forecast. And in the next uh, few months, you will see something for, from us on, on that regard. With that, Alan, uh, over to you. Uh, thank you, Cliff, uh, and thanks everyone for joining and participating on our webinar and for all your questions and comments. We will get back to you with, uh, with answers with those. Uh, so thank you again, Cliff, for leading our discussion as well as our presenters. Uh, we appreciate all the participation uh, from, from Neil and Rolf and Vijay, and we appreciate you uh, helping us out with this engaging discussion. An archive version of this webinar will be available shortly, and we'll be sending out a follow-up email on how to access that archive. And feel free to come back and view this session again, or even share it with your colleagues. And you're going to see a short survey pop up at the conclusion of the webinar, so please take a few minutes to fill that out. And make sure you follow us on Twitter for information on future IHS technology webinars. Again, thank you for joining us, and have a great rest of your day.